Welcome to the 78th Annual Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology. This year's topic is Immunity and Tolerance. I'm Lori Dempsey, Senior Editor of Nature Immunology, and with me is Dr. Stephen Smale, Professor at uh, UCLA. And Steve, you're also a co-organizer for this year's conference, and you've put together a, a wonderful program, you and your fellow uh, co-organizers. Thank you. So welcome. So much of your research has uh, uh, been focused on uh, gene expression, inducible gene expression of cells of, of the immune system. And can you actually tell us a little bit more about some of the, the topics that you're, you're looking at in terms of uh, cytokine expression that's induced by when an organism or when cells are exposed to uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, molecules, uh, microbial molecules and whatnot that activate the uh, expression programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at this point we're really just trying to understand logic. We want to, okay. you know, that the, there's, a, there's got to be, and I think we have some evidence that, uh, um, that in response to a stimulus, mm -hmm. that a macrophage or any other type of cell that's going to respond to a stimulus will, is known to activate lots of genes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, those genes will all be in the genome assembled into chromatin. and. Uh, um, and it's known that there's many different chromatin structures that are, are uh, um, in the vicinity of genes that undergo certain types of alterations, mm -hmm. or some genes may not undergo certain types of alterations mm -hmm. when they're when they're induced. And uh, there's got to be a logic, and that's right, really right. what we're trying to understand: is to dissect the uh, transcriptional cascade and response. And there's to there's waves of expression, correct? Exactly. So it's it's a it's a temporal cascade, which mm -hmm. is a, a clue that of how we can go about uh, um, understanding the, the logic that mm -hmm. there's you know that there's some genes that are activated within minutes of, okay. of, okay. Re of receiving the stimulus others that will be slightly delayed others that will have long delays some many that do not require any other genes to be transcribed and translated before they're induced okay. so there's a primary response genes and then those that depend on other genes as secondary response genes. Right, so right. there's a lot of signaling pathways, there's a lot of transcription factors involved that are induced by the signaling pathways. Right. There's different chromatin organizations right, that like are involved. The nucleosome positioning that you've actually it, been studying it, as, exactly. as well as... Exactly, yeah. And so, okay. the, so the question is to understand, understand the, the, the logic of the entire process. How does it fit together? How do you get that, that cascade? And right. most importantly for the long term, uh, why, how does it, how does that logic fit into the selectivity in response right, right. to different stimuli? Right, right. So th take us back, say, maybe 10 years ago when people were looking at, like, say, one gene, one pathway mm -hmm. uh, versus uh, what's, you know, one of the exciting things is that there's been uh, uh, new uh, technology mm -hmm. that has uh, allowed us to look at global expression patterns. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, just kind of set yeah. the stage of, of what you were able to do maybe 10 years ago mm -hmm. versus uh, you know, some of the things that you now are able to do and some of the new insights that are coming right. out of this research. So that's what's really exciting. And it actually, for, for people in my generation, it's what keeps us energized because <laughs> I, you know, from those of us who started 30 years ago in, in, uh, um, in science, that it was 30 years ago that it was became possible to first study transcriptional regulation um, at really at any level mm -hmm. in eukaryotic cells. And from the, the early 1980s through uh, um, you know, the, the 21st century, that the analyses really had to focus on studying individual model genes okay. with the hope that, uh, um, that the insights that you would learn from studying your model gene would then be relevant more broadly to a large number of genes mm -hmm. and teach general principles how right. gene regulation and a cascade was regulated. So this is when we're, we're uh, identifying our, uh, the, the players that are involved in these processes. Right. So, so, so that's when a lot, there was a lot of you know, the most fundamental key common regulators were, were discovered and that was mm -hmm. really useful. The problem mm -hmm. with that that became frustrating over time was that uh, um, in, for example, studies of, of the role of chromatin structure in right. inducible transcription that we right. found for the model gene that we were studying, the IL-12P right, right. or IL-12P40 gene, that there was a position nucleosome um, uh, uh, encompassing the promoter that needed to be remodeled and opened up prior to transcription. So off before, but then yeah. when you get a stimulus, then it had to be positioned before the gene could be uh, uh, right, transcribed. Right, it had to be opened up, it had to be okay. loosened in some way. Yeah. But others were finding, for example, John Liss with his studies of Drosophila heat shock transcription, mm -hmm. that, uh, um, that heat shock genes were already in an open chromatin structure okay. in the unstimulated cells with, in, in, you know, in many cases, with the RNA polymerase already initiated and paused 
okay. uh, waiting for the stimulus to release the pause so elongation could continue. Mm -hmm. And when at the in the days of studying individual model genes, there was this uncertainty: what does this mean? Why do some genes right. have one mechanism, others have a different mechanism? Is this right. just random evolution that different mechanisms randomly evolved, or is somebody studies right and somebody else wrong, right, being misled right, right. by their their techniques they were using? and their results, um, or is there a logic that we don't quite appreciate? Right, and right. so that's what really changed with the, you know, in this century, is that uh, um, beginning with genome sequences that right, right. Uh, provided the, the sequence information that was made it possible to really be looking at a So you can actually map certain level. things, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. The problem was that, uh, um, that, you know, that, that when the sequences became available for humans in 2001 and for mice slightly later than that, that we didn't have the technology really for taking advantage of that. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what's really been exciting over the last uh, a little more than a decade is that the technological advances to right. really use the, the power of the genome sequences uh, right, um, right. through first through the development of micro microarrays right, for right. looking at genome-wide expression patterns and then through uh, a more recent higher throughput, high throughput sequencing approaches right, 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 right. That, that now we can, and, and chip seek approaches and, and many different approaches, computational biology has become really important. And so you can and actually take all these and intersect those and, and right. gain information about the, the, the logic of how these genes are actually being expressed. Right, and so that's revealing that yeah. the, the, as the, the problem that I posed, as the, that some genes seem to be in an open chromatin mm -hmm. configuration, others require nucleosome remodeling, that it's not random evolution, that there really is a, a, an underlying logic that has very important implications, both mechanistically okay. and biologically. Okay, okay. So one of the techniques you talked about um, yesterday was what you're doing is uh, the chromatin uh, tethered RNA seq. Mm -hmm. Now, explain how that's a little bit different than say, the information that somebody can get from a microarray, and, and how yeah. much more powerful that may mm -hmm. be. So, so there's two differences. One is just yeah. using RNA seq versus microarrays, and okay. microarrays emerged in the late 1990s and were uh, are an incredibly powerful technique. The first way, that, you know, method that was available to be able to uh, monitor gene expression at a genome-wide level. And it's mm -hmm, really, mm -hmm. really wonderful, amazing technique, lots of important insights of mm -hmm. being able to look at gene expression signatures that yeah. are relevant to disease states, physiological situations, uh, um, and so on. Um, the problem with microarrays is that when, you know, that they, they have certain level of accuracy, but to do the detailed types of mechanistic studies and, and uncover the type of logical questions that we're interested in in really understanding with, uh, at, with precision a transcriptional cascade that it didn't have the quantitation. It really okay. does not reveal a true dynamic range of, of how much a, a gene's expression will differ in one, in one state, in our case, in an induced cell versus the unstimulated cell. Right, right. Um, and there were also, because it didn't have the quantitation and the, the accurate dynamic range, that also leads to some problems with, with accuracy of the technique, right. which isn't a problem when you're just looking at a signature, but it's a problem when you, when you really want to scrutinize mechanism. And so right, for, right. for our studies, it became incredibly important when RNA-seq emerged uh, um, as a high throughput method that really makes it possible to just isolate RNAs, make libraries, and, and, and sequence extensively to gain insight into transcript levels. Right, right. The, the chromatin um, associated RNA seq is, uh, um, is one of a few different methods that can be used to look at nascent transcripts as opposed mm -hmm. to messenger RNA. So this actually adds a, a temporal control as well uh, in terms yeah. of. of the, the transcript steady state uh, regulation versus what's actually being fired as you say as a nascent transcript. Exactly. Then when you're looking at messenger RNA, which has uh, traditionally been done for microarrays and also for most RNA seq, mm -hmm. when looking at inducible transcription, the problem is that after a gene gets fully activated at a transcription level, it can take some time for the, the mRNA to reach its maximum steady state level. So okay. when you're doing messenger RNA, RNA-seq, you're not really getting the transcriptional kinetics. Right, and, right. Uh, um, and so by, by looking at the chromatin-associated transcripts, then you get a much better view of, of kinetics, of true kinetics, of mm -hmm. when a gene is, mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. genes are turned on and when genes are turned off so that right. you can then I identify groups of genes that are, are coordinately regulated. And, mm -hmm. and other methods like GrowSeq and NetSeq and metabolic okay. labeling can okay. do pretty much the same thing. They each have have certain advantages and disadvantages for specific questions, but they right. all 
a monitor nascent transcripts, which is right. really valuable. Right, right, right. And so what are some of the um, uh, questions now that you're actually looking to, to address in the future? I mean, since you now have of some of these underlying logic, or maybe should I back up and say, yeah. you know, some, what are some of the, the insights then you're gaining that, that you can start putting these layers of, of regulation into a, a, a logical module? Yeah, so, so it's really, it's, it's very, it's fascinating, it's fun. It's just that, the, that all of this is entirely new to be able to use the technology. So every experiment we do is, is revealing new insights, and I think you'd hear this broadly from uh, um, anyone using new technologies uh, mm -hmm. um, at, at this meeting. And what we've found you know, many insights into looking at the true temporal cascades and getting a sense that there's actually you know, very small numbers of genes that are, are induced within minutes. Mm -hmm. um, we can find common transcription uh, factors that seem to be regulating those genes that are not NF-kappa B, the gene that's been thought to be the right, dominant right. regulator of right, inducible right. transcription in, in macrophages and other immune cell types. And uh, um, we can, you know, we've been able to find uh, uh, chromatin distinctions of, of understanding, you know, why, it, you know, which types of genes seem to have uh, um, active chromatin even before the gene is induced right, versus right, right. those that seem to be assembled into uh, closed nucleosomes that, that need to be opened. And, uh, um, and at this point, we're really at the phase of wanting to, to build on this and, and put together, you know, continue to bring in more data sets. Uh, um, I think we we're, we're actually are getting... Uh, um, a, what I think is a preliminary understanding of a basic cascade through okay. two hours in response to one stimulus, which is right, lipid A is the active yeah. component of, of LPS. There's still a, a, a lot that we don't understand, but we have you know, many uh, um, you know, insights that I, as we continue to try to refine that, mm -hmm. I think we're in a state that we can start moving forward and looking at the, the key, you know, things of interest to immunologists and right, biologists, right, right. such as where, where is the selectivity coming from when we right, start right. You know, activating with other stimuli other than lipid A that activate through other TLRs, for example, other receptors that, that how does the cascade differ and what is the relevance of that dif difference, both mechanistically so and biologically. Different pathways coming in, crosstalk, different factors being induced, turning on different suites of genes right. at, at different time points. Right, and, and I, yeah, we'll see how, how yeah. different they really are. I, yeah, I, yeah. I think that although there's clear biological differences, that yeah. I think we are going to find that in some situations that the differences are uh, um, quite small. That I think that's, you know, w with the precision, one of the big surprises that we've had is that uh, um, that when we find clusters of genes that are are co-regulated and that really stand out, uh, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. we sometimes will end up with a cluster of a single gene that has very unique m uh, um, modes of regulation relative to everything else. So there's a kind of a sense that's uh, um, pervasive in the field that that you know that all these that networks are going to include uh, um, hundreds of genes that are co-regulated with each other, but. It for biological relevance, uh, and, and when we look at it more carefully, I think we find that there's a lot of uh, unique features of okay. individual genes that, that jump out you know, much more easily than expected. So I think when we, when we compare uh, um, different stimuli, that in some cases there's going to be extensive differences. In other cases, it's going to be one gene or a very small yeah, number of genes that are this information will that point to those nodes, then mm -hmm. the key player. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're very excited about that. And also not only looking at just different stimuli, but looking at different physiological settings. So there's That's an true. elusive physiological mechanisms for, for years, such as mechanisms by which IL-10 as an anti-inflammatory downregulates and inhibits inflammatory gene expression. It's known that, that IL-10 will target a specific subset of inducible mm -hmm. genes to mm -hmm. suppress mm -hmm. their expression. Right. A very important physiological question, but the mechanism by which that works has been elusive for a long time. Similarly, the, the issue of endotoxin tolerance, true, very true. physiological, thought to be a very physiologically important process. Mechanisms have been proposed, but it's still a, a fairly uh, um, a mysterious area that by having insight into uh, you know, the logic of, of specific networks that then we can start understanding how that is modulated in that type of the setting. And finally, we think that this will be relevant to human disease, that in, in, in understanding many different issues of, of responsiveness and non-responsiveness to therapies, uh, right, um, right. and understanding just the, the true mechanistic basis of, of certain types of, of, of immune-related diseases, that, that to have the, this uh, very clear 
uh, um, understanding of a, of a cascade that then you can align data sets coming from human patients and, and, and hope that, that it can provide some insight and in mechanistic and, and biological value. Yeah. Well, it sounds like we have a lot to look forward to then. That's actually great. I hope so. so, so. Well, Steve, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.